Okay. Hello. Uh, sorry, I was a little late. I didn't know where this place was. <laughs> uh, okay, so sorry that people are on the floor. Uh, you deserve it. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, some of you will decide to stay home and watch lectures at some point, but as long as people are happy on the floor, then uh, I would prefer that you're all here, because then you can ask some questions. I'm Richard. Uh, some of you know that. Um, before I get started with the, you know, railway here of the lecture, are there any questions for me about the teacher? Anything? <coughs> no? Anything comes up? You know, you know where to find me, any emails and things? Uh, we have a lot to do uh, this quarter, so I want to get right into it. Uh, let me start by just giving you a little bit of the history of this course for me, so you know where I'm coming from and what I intended to do. The, the simple version is I'm, I'm trying to teach the course that I always wanted when I was in grad school and never got. Uh, what I got in grad school, is, I think what most people get in grad school, is you're desperately trying to do science and there's no way to learn statistics, but you must do statistics to have a career. Uh, and it was awful, and it was painful. And... I don't want anybody else to have to go through that because it's, it's a terrible purgatory, right? Uh, and it's the reason that there's a lot of mess uh, out there, I think. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is give you um, a functional whole style of model-based statistical inference that is, I think, becoming dominant in biology and some parts of the social sciences. Um, and But there are other styles as well. And the goal of this style, uh, in the sense that it's model-based, is because you're approaching your problem with some existing theoretical lens already. You don't need the statistical framework to give you hypotheses. Uh, so uh, that is why this picture is up here to prompt me for. I study um, humans in the context of environmental systems, and I'm a big fan of irrigation and terracing and things like this as, as these sort of systems that, that are compelling to me. This is a Chinese terrace system. You're seeing the reflection of the sky uh, in the ponds here. Um, and these systems are incredibly complicated, and they have spatial and temporal dynamics, and part of the scientific goals of studying these systems is to understand the dynamical systems, the dynamical, the equations that describe the dynamical systems. So you come to the statistics in, in the sort of problems I work on uh, with equations in mind. You have models, and you then there's data, and you're like, how do I get these things to talk to one another? And if you get, take an ordinary statistics course, you will learn nothing about that. Uh, in this course, you will learn very little about that. Uh, and the reason is because when I started, so I arrived as assistant professor at UC Davis, and people were like, you do math, Richard, why don't you teach the SACS course, too? And I was like, uh, I want tenure, sure. I'll teach this, too. Uh, but I started out as a modeler uh, who did some ecological stuff. And um, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a big uh, uh, sort of data science background. But uh, since I do applied math, it isn't so hard to pick this stuff up, so that's an advantage. Uh, but I came at it with the idea that I already had theories, um, which is different than, say, the, I'll get into some of this today, the idea that you just look at the data and you're just looking for differences between treatment groups. Um, so I, the first time I taught a stats course in graduate school, um, uh, two graduate students, rather, uh, it was from that perspective. Uh, here's population growth equations in, in ecology or economics, uh, various dynamical system things, and we're gonna, we've got some data from the system, and we want to contrast the different explanatory models, given the data. Um, and, and that, I still think, is the eventual goal. But what I found is most people, well, most people were like me. They had had such a bad statistics preparation that they weren't ready for that. Uh, and many of you may be, and that's great. Um, but hopefully you will enjoy the pedestrian introduction in any event. So over time, I've, sl I've slowly dialed back the course a bit. It's still hard work, as you'll see, uh, but you'll appreciate it. Uh, dialed it back to basically reteach regression because most people have never had a good course in regression. So maybe you had a course in regression and it was just painful, right? It's like post-traumatic stress. And, you know, there would be matrices, maybe you did a Koleski decomposition, and then you black out. <laughs> and and that, I get that. I, I do completely. Um, so uh, we're going to work towards something more satisfying, where we can really match uh, our theoretical models of the systems we study to the data, and thinking of statistical inference as an interface between these two not a framework for providing um, hypotheses or, or simple null hypotheses, but something more substantive, developing predictive models of natural systems. Uh, but to get there, we're going to sort of start over. And so over time, so originally this course was called statistical thinking because I wanted to contrast different styles of statistical analysis. Um, and so I, you know, there were like three major contemporary philosophies of statistical inference, and I sort of taught them all three, and it was a disaster uh, because it was too much. 
So now there's only one, and it's Bayesian, because that's my internal narrative is Bayesian, which is frightening, but true. <laughs> and uh, so that's what this course has become and dialed back. And I think it's a much better course now, and you'll let me know, but I think it is. Um, so that's, that's the history where we're coming from. And the topical coverage over the 10 weeks, uh, it's fairly compressed because 10 weeks is not a lot of time, as you guys know. Those of you who come from semester systems, you're like, what's going on here? Right? Uh, 10 weeks, we like open the door. Um, and that's just how it is, I'm afraid. Uh, but in week one, um, we're going to start this today. I want to give you uh, the philosophy of Bayesian inference and some of the mechanics. Uh, we'll, we'll move pretty fast here. It'll be pretty easy going because there's not a lot of computational work initially. Uh, but you'll start to do computations, and you will have a homework this week because chapter three has a lot of R code in it. Um, next week, uh, you're going to relearn regression, or what I call them linear models. And it'll be recognizable, but you're going to work more with nuts and bolts of things. Um, so you'll, you'll really get it, I hope. Um, and this will cover, cover chapters three uh, and, uh, and four. Um, then we're uh, uh, going to look at multivariate regression. Um, by week, uh, uh, week three, you'll start to seem pretty easy because you'll have gotten your practice in week two. That's the same kind of thing. So just like add some more parameters. It will all make sense as you get there. Um, and then week four... Uh, we're going to do model comparison and information criteria uh, because you'll have learned a bunch of modeling and now there'll be multiple models and you'll need to do something about it. And I'll say something more today about why we want to do that. Um, and then I'm going to spend a whole week on interactions and interaction effects because I think it's often, um, let's say, nature is full of interaction effects. An interaction effect is when uh, the effect of one manipulation depends upon the value of something else in the system. And natural systems are full of conditions like that. And I often think stats courses underplay interaction because it's mathematically easy, but it's conceptually very difficult. So we'll spend an entire week on it. You will feel really awesome at the end of that week because you'll be so good at the coding at this point. So basically, there are no, the coding tools you learn next week are going to carry all the way through uh, to week five. And you're going to feel awesome really well. Uh, those of you taking this for the second time, you can nod affirmatively. And I'll tip you later. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then week six happens, and there's like a transition. Uh, we're going to learn Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, because we're going to need it to fit the more complicated models. And uh, then we transition into what many people think of as Bayesian inference, which is how you fit the model, uh, which is, I'll try to convince you today, not what Bayesian inference is. Uh, it's an interpretation of probability instead. And then we'll learn generalized linear models, uh, which are incredibly useful. You can think of these as nonlinear regressions, counts, mixture models. Um, Multi-level models or mixed, mixed models, and by week 10, uh, you guys will be so awesome, we'll do things like uh, incorporate measurement error and all kinds of uncertainty into our models. you never have to create averages in your data again, um, and we can even impute missing values, uh, and I'll show you how to do that, um, which is not naughty. It is more naughty to drop case, incomplete cases than it is to impute missing values. I'll try to convince you. That's our objective, and I'm leaving a bunch of stuff out here, but along the way, I'm going to put in little stubs to link you to other things, like phylogenetic regression is a special case of uh, something we'll get to um, in week nine called Gaussian processes. Uh, we'll talk about there, and I'll try to link these links to it as we go. All right, that's the goal. Um, mechanics, before I get into material, I'm trying to put everything on the website. The notes are there. I'm recording this lecture right now. It seems to be functioning because there's an audio meter that's flipping around as I talk. Uh, I will export this as a slide cast, so if you decide you prefer to stay at home or you just like to hear me over and over again, you can, uh, you can do that. I have a soothing radio voice, I'm told. Uh, and so uh, uh, the homework uh, every week is meant to be a group project. And what that allows me to do is assign hard, realistically difficult homework so you feel the burn. Uh, and we work as a group with other people. Um, these are, these are homework problems which involve analysis and inference, so they're not toy problems, but you work with them in groups because that's how you're going to do science. And the great thing about teaching PhD students like yourselves is you're all wonderful people and you really want to learn this stuff, so I don't have to worry about cheating, right? If you slack off, I mean, you're only hurting yourself, so I don't do any policing, I don't care. Uh, you're going to build team skills, too, by working on these homeworks together. And everybody has a different problem with the homework, so when you work together, you all get warm glows and feel good about it. Um, so uh, you'll, you'll submit them to your Dropbox, and Paul, who's around here someplace, where, where's Paul? There, Paul's on the floor. He's the reader. He will be grading these. So if you have a problem with the grading, <laughs> no, he will mainly check them off. Yeah, it'll work. Um, uh, please submit them, though, for Paul's sake in PDF form, uh, because Microsoft Word, even the same version of different computers, the images don't always show up correctly. That's just an issue 
So if you just export it to PDF, uh, it'll work out great. Or if you do everything in a plain text script with your R code and comments, that's okay too. Um, we can handle that. Final exam is going to be take home. You get a week to work on it. This is the only part of the course you do by yourself, um, or you can ask me for help, and uh, it'll be due one week later. If you are going to the Grand Canyon, is anybody here going to the Grand Canyon in the last week of the course? Yeah, okay. If you're two people, all right, so that's cool. <laughs> uh, you can We can figure out a schedule for you to do the final exam so it doesn't interfere with the Grand Canyon thing, okay? Just, when we get closer, let me know. There's always somebody going to the Grand Canyon at the end of this course. I wish I could go. <laughs> it would be fun, but there's no way I could get out of the mechanics of, of my life. <laughs> to do it. My life is a big machine with grinding gears, and if I leave, the whole thing explodes. Um, but, uh, so, uh, uh, final exam, your grade, uh, everybody gets an A because everybody works awesome and hard in this course. Uh, very rarely are there any grading problems, but it's half and half. Um, and I just want to say, it, this course is a lot of work, but you're going to learn a lot, and I think... Um, the several hundred people who've taken versions of it before have either they have Stockholm syndrome or it's a good course. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> uh, so, but I do want to caution you. There's this experience early on in the course where, so th this is my in front, my cartoon of the the uh, gain in knowledge level of knowledge against week for an average student. So initially, there's this incline and you're walking uphill. So the burn is the slope of a line tangent to the curve at any particular point, right? That's called the difficulty. Your sensation of difficulty will be the, ta the tangent line at any particular point. So initially you feel a little bit, but it's not so bad. And then typically in week two, it feels like you're climbing El Capitan. <laughs> uh, and it's going to feel bad, but you're going to get, someone's going to push you up over this hill and you'll be all right. Usually it gets steep there because you have to learn R at the same time you're learning the statistics. And some of you have good R backgrounds and some of you don't. But it, you get past it. Uh, you just struggle through it. And it'll be great. And the evidence of that is people have taken the course before. So that's why I put this up. Your planning is it's going to burn right there. Uh, if it doesn't, you're wonderful. You're fantastic. You're a superhero. And just keep going. Or rather push your colleagues up over the hill is what I'd ask you to do. But you get past that. And then there's this clean sailing until information theory, uh, <laughs> and then you're going to feel some burn again. But it'll be great when you come out of it, because there's no information theory, right? It'll be wonderful. And, um, and then it, it's never quite as difficult as it was before. Uh, but you're, at the end of this, your, your altitude will be a lot higher than it was at the beginning, and um, you will be rock stars, okay? or whatever you want to be. Country stars, if you prefer. Sorry, <laughs> I don't mean the privileged rock music. There's nothing special. Anyway, <laughs> so sorry. I'm an anthropologist. As soon as I like privilege one thing, I have to stop myself. <laughs> it's a disciplinary uh, thing. Um, okay, so let me let me begin the course with a metaphor. There's a lot of metaphor in this course because I'm trying to help you guys learn by establishing emotional connections to the material through metaphor. And uh, the one I want to start with is. Um, designed to get past this sort of, there's this aura about mathematical topics, uh, and I, which I think comes from the way math is taught in elementary school, that there's one way to solve every mathematical problem, and if you do it any other way, you will fail the test, right? Your teacher will penalize you. Even, sometimes even if you have a correct approach, but it's different than the one you were taught, you get penalized, right? This happens in, in elementary school over and over again. Uh, the truth is, in applied math, it ain't like that. Uh, in this is like, statistics is like engineering. There's not one way to build a bridge. There's lots of ways to build bridges. And some of them are better or worse for other cases. But in many cases, there are many aspects of the design that we don't comprehend when we do the planning. Uh, and so uh, engineering is mainly a history of bridges falling down and then figuring out why they fell down <laughs> and then making better bridges. And statistics is very similar to that. Math is involved, but that doesn't mean there's only one solution. Uh, for each experiment, there are many legitimate uh, uh, statistical analyses, and there are even more bad ones. Uh, and that's much like engineering. All right, many ways to build an airplane, many more bad ways to build an airplane. Um, so let me give you an alternative metaphor, uh, one that's more linked to engineering, but has the kind of monstrous nature that I want to have. And that is the, the legend of the golem. Some of you have heard about uh, golems before from folklore, but in case you haven't, uh, golem is uh, kind of an ancient legend uh, uh, from uh, the Abrahamic communities, uh, now what we call the Jews, uh, where it's a clay construct. I think of them as clay robots. It's the first kind of folklore robot. And um, uh, it comes from this Hebrew for shapeless mass. And in the, in the legends of this, um, the rabbis who were steeped in the Kabbalah, the rituals of this, could give life to inanimate objects. This was um, uh, through simple recipes. You get a ton of clay, for example, form it into a humanoid shape. You, you put words on it. And like in many uh, cultures, words are in, endowed with uh, magical effects. 
right? No, I don't think they are, right? Because I can say snake and you picture a snake, even though you don't want to, right? So words are magic. But uh, uh, and in the in the classic golem legend, the, the Hebrew word for truth is what's inscribed on its brow because that's what animates life is truth or the quest for it. Um, now the thing about about legends of the golem though is the golem is inherently dangerous. So in the most famous uh, legend of this, um, which comes from Prague, and, and I start the book with this story as well, uh, uh, the rabbi uh, uh, Yuda constructed a golem to defend uh, the Jews of Prague from persecution from blood libel and um, and it was able to do that, but the thing about golems is they're they're not really smart. They follow instructions, but they also break stuff, uh, like Prague. Uh, and so it's a very powerful thing, and if you if you don't treat it with extreme caution, it can also break things. And this is the metaphor I want you to have in mind in statistics, uh, which may seem like I'm trying to undermine what I do for a living, uh, and that is correct. It's exactly what I'm trying to do. And I think... There's this casualness about statistical inference. Uh, we, we need it to learn about the world because we study complex systems. Uh, but at the same time, there's this casualness as if we can just, you know, not invest a lot of effort in learning about how we're doing it and processing information and everything will be okay. And I don't think it will. Um, so these things, I love this quote. Uh, uh, this seems to be from, there was really a Rabbi Judah. I don't think he actually made a golem, but he did actually say this as far as I can tell. But even the most perfect of golem risen to life to protect us can easily change into a destructive force. Therefore, let us treat carefully that which is strong, just as we bow kindly and patiently to that which is weak. Uh, so there's power in these things. And that's why we're attracted to these sorts of constructs like statistical <laughs> models. Um, uh, but that also means we have to regard them as something other than magical. They don't have direct access to the truth. They're automatons, uh, and they're bumbling, and they don't understand our intent, what we wanted them to do. They're just slaves to their instructions. And so uh, there's a lot of burden on us to be careful, and we can't offload responsibility onto these tools. So just to create the parallelism to understand why uh, I want you to think about golems, uh, models as golems in a sense, or some sort of robot, um, a clunky organic robot, uh, well, there's the silly part. Golems are made of clay. Models are made of, well, we write them in computers now, so they're made of silicone. That's, that's the best I could do. Uh, both animated by truth in the sense that uh, we are motivated by trying to figure out what's true, the true state of the world, and that's why we can create constructions like this. Um, uh, uh, the golem is powerful in legend. Models are hopefully powerful. They're not all very powerful. Some of them are terrible. Um, we'll do some terrible ones. Uh, both are blind to the creator's intent in the sense that when you deploy a statistical model, it's not smart, right? It doesn't pay attention. It's vastly dumber than you are, even though it has powers of analysis that you don't have, that none of us have. Uh, and there's this weird cooperation that goes on between them. Uh, it's easy to misuse. And there's this uh, thing about models, this famous saying from George Box, that all models are false and some are useful. And that's a good saying, but one, a better way to think about that is that... Um, uh, Models are false in the same way that bridges are false. It, it just doesn't, it's a category error to even label them as true or false, right? So th there's this thing, and it has behavior in the world, and we need to understand its behavior to use it properly. It isn't that it's true or false, it's a tool. No one speaks about a hammer being false for making a table, right? <laughs> and so the statistical models are hammers. They're, they're appropriate hammers for your particular uh, job, and that's the way we're going to approach these problems. Um, and the, and the re one of the reasons to create this metaphorical cultural wrapping uh, for our introduction to statistical modeling is that I want to argue uh, uh, against the classical view of what statistics is, which is it's a way to test hypotheses, uh, that it's kind of the crisis point of every scientific study is a hypothesis test and it results in an asterisk or not, and then you can publish it or not. Right. And I don't think that statistics is actually very good at testing hypotheses, even though quantitative rituals have, have risen up to do that. Um, mainly outside of statistics, I should say. Statisticians have been, have been uh, perennially cautious about this, but once statistical methods get loose in the sciences, they evolve. They're selected to sustain your career. And as a consequence, they're very good at producing p-values that are small. And, and I do think it's a selection effect. Uh, so uh, uh, one way to think about this is, at some point, you've got to leave behind teaching a bunch of these classical methods that have been eclipsed by more modern things. And so at the beginning here, that's what I've been used to use doing. Uh, you can take a bunch of really good stats courses that teach these classical methods, and these classical methods are useful in fairly narrow contexts. Most of these methods are thought of as procedures or tests, uh, things like the Wilcoxon rank sum tests and key tests and all those things. Each of those is useful. It's a little goal. It, it embodies a model. It has particular assumptions. It's only useful in certain situations. Most of them are not terribly powerful because they were developed back when, well, nobody had computers, really, uh, for the most part. 
that's not a slight against them. They're, they're just golems from a previous era. Uh, but at some point, it's too much to ask you guys to learn all of these things. And when your elderly colleagues use a, a Wilcoxon rank sum test, just say, okay, well, what are the assumptions of that test? You don't, at some point, you just have to forgive yourself for not knowing that stuff. Uh, you don't need that anymore. Uh, there's an archival reason to know about those things, but we can do a lot better now. Um, so we're going to shuffle past that burden and instead try to replace this with another way to think about it. And that is, these tests, uh, I think a lot of the motivation for thinking of statistical inference as a collection of tests is because science is supposed to advance through falsification of hypotheses. So I want to spend a little bit of time now um, talking about why uh, falsification is a criterion that demarks scientific hypotheses, but it's not a criterion that advances them. Uh, and that is the consensus in philosophy of science. This will be news to scientists because usually all you ever hear about is that Popper proved that science advances through falsification. Uh, and that's not what philosophers of science think. It's not what Popper thought. Uh, falsificationism was about demarcation. What is science? It's not about how science works. Uh, now let me spend some time talking about that and why falsification, or what I call Popperism, uh, is not a realistic objective for our golems to satisfy. So I define popperism. I put the ism on it to distinguish it from what Popper actually wrote. I'll have some quotes here. Um, the idea that science progresses by logical falsification of hypotheses, in, in particular null hypotheses. Uh, therefore, statistics should aim to falsify. Otherwise, it's not scientific. Uh, uh, there's a consensus in philosophy of science and philosophy of statistics that this is not correct. Uh, it is a folk philosophy developed in the sciences, and I think it should be abandoned. It's, if, if any of you hold this, it's not your fault. right? You didn't invent it. You were taught it at some point. Um, one of the psychological things about this that I think is counterproductive is it puts a burden on individuals and individual procedures now. Uh, so if you don't get the rejection of a hypothesis that you wanted, you did something wrong somehow, right? Because the method is impeccable. This is the right thing it's supposed to be doing. Um, instead, uh, or on your individual study, the burden's on you. Instead, science is a process of cultural evolution that takes generations to figure out how systems work. Uh, the individual burden on you and your career should not be seen to be some gigantic logical problem that you have to be able to solve it. Sometimes we just can't measure things precise enough to do these issues, so we need uh, better tools. Um, so let me, let me focus in on a couple of the logical reasons that falsification is in practice impossible. It's not the kind of thing that we can really do here. Um, let me give you an example that's from population biology. Uh, apologies to the social scientists in the room. I, I love you guys. I'm half the time a social scientist myself, or well, like a quarter of the time a social scientist, I guess, increasingly less. But uh, uh, I think you'll still get what's going on here, because there are analogous sorts of problems in the social sciences. Um, in a generation past in evolutionary biology and population biology, there was this big debate over no neutral evolution, how much selection mattered in explaining uh, genetic diversity uh, at the molecular level. And this is most often identified with um, Moto Kimura, population geneticist from Japan, who did an amazing amount of work, actually, understanding the mathematics of neutral evolution and its consequences for molecular variation. So let's think about this case where, and, and what Kimura and his students did is they went out testing the null hypothesis that selection mattered or not by looking at the expectations of this neutral model and then looking at frequency distributions of alleles in populations, mainly human populations, and asking whether they could reject the null model or not. And if they didn't, they concluded that evolution was neutral. And they did that over and over again. Meanwhile, lots of people here at Davis like uh, Gillespie, screamed, no, you can't do that. And I want to show you why uh, that doesn't work, that logical inference doesn't work. So let's take H0 is this hypothesis evolution is neutral. And I want to make a distinction, a tripartite distinction between hypotheses, which are nearly always verbal and kind of murky, right? They involve lots of sort of unstated assumptions and it's, it's vague. It's a, it's, a, it's a statement like evolution is neutral. Um, and then there's a process model, which is typically mathematical. Uh, and sometimes people just skip this step entirely, uh, as, as you'll see. Um, but in, in Kimura's case, he didn't. Much to his credit, he made a process model. Of the, there's a, you make assumptions about the structure of the genome and how mutations work, and you can generate from that logical consequences of the model. Uh, in particular, there are assumptions. There are many process models, as I'll show you in a second, that may correspond to the statement evolution is neutral. As soon as you get to the process model, it's different than your hypothesis already. Uh, this will make sense when I get, give you an example in a second. Each pro a process model can then be made uh, into a statistical model, which would usually, there's some distribution of frequencies of observations that are implied by the process model, and we look for those um, as evidence uh, that something is consistent uh, with the process model. Now, the problem is, uh, and a lot of this went on here at Davis uh, by the now-retired uh, Gillespie, who was in EVE, 
Um, the alternative that people had in mind was that selection matters, which is even more vague than evolution is neutral, <laughs> right? Uh, why? Because sele selection takes many different forms, and all population biologists know this. A crazy number of different forms. And people who do artificial selection know this even more, because they create forms of selection which are never found uh, in nature, right? Like truncation selection, right? Like none of the cows with less than certain percent of rump fat uh, get to breed. Right? I don't think that ever happens in a natural system, um, but it happens in farms. And uh, so selection can matter in a bunch of different ways. And so there are a bunch of different process models that correspond to the Bayes hypothesis. And they can differ in quite subtle ways as well, and they can correspond to their own statistical models. Now, here's, here's the neat thing. So what Gillespie showed is that if you have selection in a fluctuating environment, it'll produce the same frequency distribution as Kimura's neutral model. Uh, and this became something of an industry for Gillespie. Every time Kimura would create a neutral model, Gillespie would find a selection model that mimic, mimicked it. Uh, and, but it, this could be done in lots of systems. Uh, uh, and as the course goes on, and it gives you some idea of why this happens as a consequence of something called uh, uh, information entropy uh, or entropy aggregation, that statistical models are always going to conform to a bunch of different process models. Um, in the physical sciences, they often call this the inverse problem. That if you've got some phenomenon in nature and you're trying to figure out what caused it, there are going to be a bunch of candidates that are consistent with the data. And it's just a necessary problem. Uh, this creates lots of logical difficulties. Um, and let me fill in the final part uh, of, of the, of the uh, figure here. Um, evolution is neutral is also vague. Uh, Kimura's version was that you have an equilibrium population size. And that's a very special assumption. So if the population is growing or shrinking, or say that the population size varies through time, which it does in natural populations, at least the ones I study, uh, then, you get, uh, then you get yet another uh, uh, distribution that would also be neutral. So even if they rejected uh, the expectations of this model, that doesn't mean selection matters, right? The world could still be neutral. So nobody wins from this. Everybody's in pain. Uh, how do you avoid this? Well, you need multiple models and meaningful non-null models, non-null models, and you can contrast them. And in the form of data you're intending to collect, you can't distinguish them. Like in the case of uh, Gillespie's uh, fluctuating selection model, Kimura's neutral equilibrium model, they make the same kind of frequency distribution, then you need a different description of the data. And that's how this empirical literature evolved. And as soon as people realized that, they looked at the data different ways. How, you might say? Across space and time, uh, these models don't look the same. And when you look at them temporally, the fluctuations in, in uh, frequencies through time or through space, uh, Russ Landy has done some interesting work on this in Butterflies in the Amazon. It's really nice work. Um, then it's clear Kimura was wrong. Uh, or we should say Kimura was wrong. His model was wrong. Kimura did great work, and I'm not trying to diminish his impact. It was a very productive uh, uh, career. Um, it's just that there was lots of logical tying in knots because of this idea that you can, you can do good science, figure out how nature works, just by rejecting the null model. Or accepting it. And I don't think that's usually true for any interestingly complex system. Ecology has recently gone through a rehearsal of this with the, the neutral theory of, of ecological communities, right? The Hubble stuff. The ecologists in here know what I'm saying. Again, very productive, but it's a shame they couldn't have just borrowed the lesson from population genetics and figured out already that actually, yeah, niche model, non niche model, they kind of make the same predictions. Maybe we need another kind of model. Uh, and that's where this, it has gone now. Um, does this make some sense? I do think science works, by the way, so don't be depressed by it. Science still works. It just doesn't work the way maybe you thought it did. Uh, science does work sometimes. That is, sorry, that was supposed to be a pep talk. <laughs> it didn't really. I do think science works. It works. It's not always efficient, but uh, maybe it can't be. Okay, the other thing. The logical appeal of, of popperism, of, of the folk version of Karl Popper's philosophy of science, uh, I think arises from how simple the argument is and how compelling it is. And it, it comes from this, this syllogism called modus tollens, which is just Latin for the method of destru destruction, I think, right? Uh, so tollens is like uh, destruction, and this is method. Um, the idea is we have some hypothesis, which we're just going to call H. That hypothesis generates a logical implication, D. I'll fill out this with a, uh, an example in a moment. Um, then if we observe something other than D, we can deduce that... Uh, Something other than H is true. Uh, if we observe D, we can't infer anything, right? Because the idea is lots of things could produce D. And this is what's called modus tollens. There's a logical implication of H for D, um, but other things could also imply D. So you can't know that H is uniquely true. And this filters into the traditional statistical hypothesis testing framework in this idea, which is rarely observed, I should say, that um, you can only reject the null, you can never accept it. However, people accept the null a whole lot. Uh, I'll have some examples later on in the course. 
Uh, whether that's naughty or not is actually a difficult thing to talk about. But from the modus tollens argument, it's definitely naughty. Uh, so let me give you an example that, that uh, philosophers of science have used routinely in talking about modus tollens. Um, suppose the hypothesis is that all swans are white. Some of you know this story. Uh, Europeans used to think all swans were white because in Europe they are, uh, like lots of things in Europe. And, <laughs> I'm an anthropologist, so it's like whenever I can make fun of white people, I will. And uh, so it's like it's like an obligation in my career. But uh, so then we go to Australia, though we find out that you know uh, there are swans in Australia that are that are black, uh, and it only takes an observation of one black swan to falsify this hypothesis, right? Uh, no matter how many white swans you observe, uh, you can't say anything about the truth value of the hypothesis. And that's the power of most holes. And this is completely appropriate in this case. Uh, but let me reveal to you why this is not, in general, what we're dealing with in science. And there are two things. Uh, the first is that measurement matters. Um, usually, we're not sure what kind of color of swan we've seen. Quite often, at least for interesting problems. You guys are in uh, uh, at an R1 university uh, in, in labs with famous people, and you're going to do awesome super science, right? And uh, because of that, you're working at stuff that's hard to do. No one's quite figured out how to measure what you're doing, and there's maybe a seed bank. Sorry that the botanists are in here, right? They're only seeds. You don't know how long they've been there, like 200 years sometimes, right? And that screws up your whole system, and you don't even sure how to think about it. And it might take generations for you and your students to figure all this out. You know what? That's okay. Because uh, that's the only way to make make progress. In physics, it's the same thing. Uh, how do you measure the mass of some subatomic particle that may not exist? Well, this is a hard problem, and you can spend decades building detectors, and then more decades diffusing them, and then figuring out that French trains passing miles overhead mess up the detector, and all kinds of that's tr actually happened with CERN. And uh, so measurement's difficult. Uh, let me give you an example that I think is easy to think about, though. Um, some of you will know this story. So um, lots of the indigenous fauna of North America has been driven extinct uh, since the arrival of Europeans, or actually the arrival of people uh, in the first place. There's like multiple waves of extinctions. But uh, one of the sad extinctions, I think it's probably actually extinct, is, is the ivory billed woodpecker, um, which went extinct in historical times. And uh, yet, uh, it, was, it was possibly rediscovered in Arkansas in 2004. There's a badge that people who believe, these are the believers. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is the best photographic evidence. <laughs> so I circled the thing. I think this is actually a Sasquatch. It's more likely to exist <laughs> than the ivory billed woodpecker. Uh, they now have these swamps uh, littered with camera traps, trying to find more evidence of this bird. Um, people are going to believe in this because it, now it's possible, though. I have to I have to acknowledge it's possible that they're just a small number of them and they're out there and it's hard to detect them because I've worked with uh, camera traps uh, before too, and there are lots of things out there that never trigger them, uh, and it's it's tough. It's a sampling problem, so. Uh, we don't know, and this is hard to uh, deal with because the evidence is quite ambiguous. Uh, modus tollens cannot be applied here. You would say we only need one example of the ivory billed woodpecker to disprove the hypothesis that it's extinct, and yet we can never be sure with one observation that that's what you actually saw. Because there are other woodpeckers that kind of look like it, and that's a bad photo. right? And this stuff happens quite a lot, I think. And as a consequence, uh, sociologists of science talk about something called the experimenter's regress. Um, which is uh, coined by Collins and Pincher, these two sociologists of science, best known for the book I have on the slide here. The experimenter's regress is that, uh, be seen in this two by two table, if you believe the hypothesis is true and you observe D, you're like, I win, <laughs> right? Uh, but your colleague who doesn't believe in it is gonna say that was a measurement error. Uh, and if you believe in H and you don't observe D, you're gonna be sure it's a measurement error and you're gonna check all your instruments and you're gonna try again. Or you can put more camera traps out, <laughs> right? And you're gonna find this thing. And you know what? That's how it should be. Because sometimes it was a mistake. And the history of science is full of examples of false negations of hypotheses because of measurement mistakes. Uh, so, but sometimes it really isn't fair. And so this experiment's regress is part of the, the storm and drong of real science. That it's, it's, it's argument. It's argumentation with rules. Uh, and that, is how, that is, was Karl Popper's actual explicit um, philosophy of how science functions. Uh, so you have to keep this in mind. Um, nevertheless, we do reach consensus eventually. Um, last thing to say about measurement, uh, measurement mattering. Um, the other class of stuff, aside from observation error, is that there are lots of interesting hypotheses which are continuous. And then discrete logic, like most tollens, just doesn't apply. So imagine a whole class of hypotheses like most swans are white. Or we'd like to estimate as precisely as possible what proportion of swans are white. Well, now most tollens isn't going to help you. Observing one black swan doesn't, how do you use that to update your estimate of the proportion of swans that are white. That's what you're going to learn in this course. Uh, because the continuous version of logic is Bayesian inference. I'll say that again. The continuous version of discrete logic 
to stage in the next class. And that's all it is. And as a consequence, that logic is great because logic is disciplined and it's objective. Everybody has to do it the same way. Uh, but also logic is terrible because the assumptions have a huge effect on how good it is. And if the assumptions don't match the real world, uh, it's no good for you. Logic is garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, but it's a really powerful tool. And so Bayesian inference, I'm going to present it to use the same way. It's logic for continuous conjectures. Um, and it has uh, a uniform and optimal way to process information. Uh, but it doesn't admit simple falsifications as a consequence. And that's frustrating. And I understand that frustration. So, so let me try to summarize, and then we'll, we'll, we'll do some more statistics. Uh, strict falsification is not uh, possible in realistic scientific settings, both because um, first thing I tried to convince you of is hypotheses are not models. Hypotheses like ev uh, evolution is neutral, is not a model, and to compare things to data, we need a model, and models are more special than the hypotheses that inspire them, and typically more than one process model will correspond to the same observations. So we need comparisons. We can't isolate individual quantitative models and compare them to data and make very good progress in most interesting systems. Um, and the second, there will always be debates about measurement, and there should be, because everybody makes mistakes. Um, uh, one of the examples that was in that Colin and Pinch book, which I like quite a lot, is uh, maybe you'll know the story of uh, Louis Pasteur uh, uh, proving that um, only life begets life, that uh, rotting meat by itself does not produce maggots. Uh, turned out to be really experimentally difficult to prove that because it's hard to purify the air and get all the mold out of it. So uh, if you leave, you know, if you have uh, uh, sugar water, uh, there are spores everywhere, right? You're, you're just dusted in spores, you know, just everywhere, and yeast and everything in the room, and microorganisms around the world. Uh, and it turns out Pasteur won illegitimately. He hadn't actually purified his stuff. He had just uh, accidentally put an experiment in solution. And so he, he won by vote to the French Academy, and actually he should have lost because he couldn't purify his solution. It was not a clean experiment. Uh, and now he was right. <laughs> uh, I don't believe that maggots spontaneously or mold spontaneously generate from rotting meat. But uh, it turns out to be hard to do these things. So we need, we need to argue about measurement. It's just part of the process. Um, falsification does happen, but what I want to say is it's consensual. It's not logical. Uh, communities of scientists argue towards consensus about meanings of evidence in light of hypotheses. And uh, in most of the big successes in the history of science, uh, uh, null hypothesis significance tests have had nothing to do with the advance of important theories, right? How did we figure out how the solar system works? I don't believe there were t-tests anywhere involved in that. And in fact, if you did, if you subjected Kepler's laws of motions to a t-test, you would have rejected them because they're wrong, as are Newton's laws of motion, right? As are Einstein's equations. Uh, but they're good. They're very good for getting a probe to Mars, right? Um, and I want to say, Karl Popper's uh, emphasis on falsifiability was nearly always, not always, but nearly always about demarcation. That is, trying to draw a philosophical line between what is science and what isn't. And this was a big mission in the 20th century. It's now mainly a snooze fest for most of us, right? Or maybe in California, who knows. Uh, but, um, <coughs> but you just have to, to realize that it was about demarcation and not method. So I want to give you a quote on the right-hand side of the slide about what Popper <coughs> did think about method. This quote is from his last book uh, called The Myth of the Framework. Um, where he, I highlight the relevant part, the method of science is that of critical discussion. Uh, he thought there was lots of stuff that goes on in science, and it's actually, there are a set of norms that the community subscribes to uh, that keep us in check, um, and there's a lot of policing involved, but that it admits a lot of uh, confirmation is just as important as reputation in, in Popper's general view of it. Okay, and of course a lot has happened in philosophy of science since Popper, a lot. Um, okay, well, we want to re do real engineering, so I want to uh, give you guys a, a rigorous introduction to making statistical models uh, that you can contrast um, in light of data to help you understand systems. We need some kind of framework. And there are a bunch of different frameworks. So applied math is not like pure math, where you get the idea like a number theory, there's only one thing that's true, and addition has one unique definition, and things like that. And applied math is not like that anymore. In applied math, you typically work by you state some principles of inference that seem rational, and then you apply them, and hopefully the consequences are good. And if they're not, you stop doing that, <laughs> and you look for different principles. And that's how statistical inference is. Uh, there are different schools of thought that subscribe to different axioms, different principles of inference, um, and the implications of those inferences would form a coherent way of making decisions, uh, but those different uh, frameworks don't always agree. And the different traditions of statistical inference are like this. They're all useful. Uh, they all work. The, the non-Bayesian statistic works great, too, and Bayesian statistics works great, and they each have strengths in different areas. 
Um, I'm going to teach you the Bayesian view because I think it's the most general view. Uh, you can often understand non-Bayesian procedures as special cases or approximations to Bayesian ones. You can do the other way too, it's just more awkward. Uh, why? Because as I'll, as I'll show you, uh, I'll try to argue, um, Bayesian probability is very permissive. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big umbrella uh, that takes in a lot of concepts, whereas the other views of, of probability are more restrictive. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to try to teach you one coherent way of doing uh, mathematical modeling, but I want to emphasize from the start, this is not the only way to do it, because there is not one true way to learn about the world. There's probably no true way to learn about the world. And we're just, the universe is hostile to life. <laughs> it's a miracle that we crawled out of the ooze and built the university. Right. So um, three-part Bayesian data analysis, multi-level models, which are all the rage, I'm told, because people kept asking me to teach them. So. <laughs> and no, and they're really useful because they're a gateway drug to, uh, to building, doing really fancy engineering with uh, pieces of models. Uh, and model comparison and information criteria, which gives you a formal apparatus for contrasting different non-null models to one another in light of a common data set, um, which is why they become so popular in biology. So let me give you a quick introduction to this in the notes. Uh, I give you a lot more history and citations for the background. Uh, this is the kind of stuff you want to glaze over right now, and then after the course is over, you come back in a relaxed mode, and then you'll get it. After you actually know how to execute it, the philosophy will make some more sense. Uh, I'm afraid that's just often how it is for most students. Um, but let me try to do the best job I can to a historical introduction. Bayesian data analysis um, can be done a bunch of different ways, uh, and I'm going to teach you a particular school of it, which is the logical version of it, which is, as I stated earlier, Bayesian uh, inference is just the continuous version of discrete logic. Uh, there are other interpretations which use the word belief a lot, uh, about the beliefs of people and rational agents. And that's not the version I'm going to push on you guys, because I don't know what you believe, and I don't know what I believe. But I do know what my model believes, right? because I programmed it. And that's the only thing I can talk about. And you know what? My models typically believe some crazy stuff. <laughs> uh, and that's when I, I change them. Um, so uh, I don't like the belief thing because it makes it seem like it's normative and you should adopt the inference of your model. I think you are actually the supervisor of your crazy golem that is potentially wrecking Prague. <laughs> uh, and that's the way I want you to think about it instead. Um, Bayesian inference is, uh, uses probability to describe uncertainty. In that sense, it's the logical extension to continuous <coughs> conjectures um, of discrete logic. And I'm going to use the term plausibility to refer to these these probability assignments that the uh, that it makes, and it has a unique way uh, of working, which we'll derive. Um, and uh, I tend to identify uh, the, per the origins of this with uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, uh, although it's usually credited to Bayes, right? And Bayes did have some prominence, but Bayes didn't really develop it as a data analytic strategy. Laplace did. Uh, so I think uh, uh, Laplace didn't know about Bayes when. Uh, Laplace started working on it too. So there's a primacy fight here, right, which goes on. One was British and one was French, and, you know, they were at war. So there were fights. Uh, I don't care about that. It's, it's clear that Laplace contributed way more to the modern practice. Um, and what I want you to notice is when Laplace lived uh, in, in the eight, in 17 and 1800s, this is long before what we think of as classical statistics was developed uh, based upon sampling theory, which is what most of you have probably learned, and I'm not going to bother to talk too much about in this course. Uh, Bayesian inference is older, but it went through a hiatus uh, because the British didn't like it. The British developed sampling theory, I think. It really was basically that and um, excluded it. Um, the thing about Bayesian inference, I think one of the reasons it went on a hiatus, though, is this is computationally difficult uh, relative to sampling uh, theory. So until modern microcomputers became quite extremely powerful and we had uh, fancy algorithms like some of the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms you'll learn later on in the course, um, it wasn't practical to do it. Uh, now it is. Uh, now your phone can do really fancy Bayesian analysis uh, quite easily if, if you have a smartphone, right? And your smartphone is more powerful than all the computers that send people to the moon. So uh, not that it could send people to the moon, but you know what I mean. And um, so this is one of the resurgences. I was a graduate student in the 90s, in the, in the second half of the 1990s, and I remember when Markov Chain Monte Carlo hit the stats community and people were like, WTF, we can fit these models now. Oh my God. And then, then suddenly everybody was writing Markov chains. And it was a revolution. It really was. And now, and, it, and it, at least in biology, especially in phylogenetics, it had a massive impact. It reformatted the way everybody did data analysis really rapidly, also in genomics. And all that stuff is very Bayesian now. And this is the reason people like to take this course. Social sciences have been slower to get, get on board because they don't have typically theoretically inspired models as often, right? So, you know, like 
what's the model for how people determine which brand of soap they're going to buy? Right? Just, just, just people just do key tests for that stuff, and maybe that's fine. Uh, but biologists went crazy for this because then they could fit their actual theoretical models in the data now, um, and we're going to be working towards that goal. Um, then I want to say the history of this is it used to be controversial. So uh, Ron Fisher uh, uh, did a tremendous amount in the development of uh, the neo-Darwinian synthesis and is a real intellectual hero, fine. But his statistical stuff, I think, is mainly a wash. Uh, and he thought that Bayesian inference was, uh, well, just mistaken. Uh, and his, his most influential statement, it must be wholly rejected. Well, he was wrong about that. He was right a lot about genetics. Uh, but his, his statistical impact, I think, is going to fade rapidly as time goes on. Instead, I, I show in the bottom right here, his contemporary, Harold Jeffries, who was a geophysicist. Uh, he's credited with discovering the internal structure of the Earth by studying seismic waves, um, discovering the solid core and all that stuff. Uh, and then his, his wife was an early quantum physicist, Bertha Swirls, who was called the Lady Jeffries, which I think is a funny thing. But uh, uh, she was vastly smarter than him. Uh, did quantum mechanics uh, early on. It was, it was a big deal, actually, in quantum mechanics. And uh, 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 together, they uh, did a lot to keep um, the Bayesian thread going from Laplace forward. And uh, uh, Jeffries argued a great deal with Fisher, and Fisher was never persuaded, and Jeffries was never persuaded, and you know, they both died happy. Uh, <laughs> I think that's how it goes. But So even, I put this here not to say that statistics is a mess. I mean, it, it is, but it's not uniquely a mess. I mean, uh, just because there's math involved doesn't mean that everybody agrees upon how to do things. And there are fights. And I figure in the long run, hopefully what we now, what I'm going to teach you guys will be eclipsed by some larger framework that includes what I'm going to teach you as a special case. And that's what I would like to be true. I would like to think that we're only just begun uh, to organize our thinking about, about how to process information and learn about nature. Um, so let me give you the quick, quick contrast here. Um, the frequentist view of probability, so I said uh, Bayesian probabilities is just, uh, we use probability to describe plausibility of different statements, of different possibilities about what is happening in the world. This is in contrast to the frequentist view of probability where probability is a limiting frequency um, <coughs> of events in the world. Uh, so if we had an infinite amount of data, a probability describes the, the limit of the frequency of some event in a collection. Um, uh, all the uncertainty then in statistical inference, or nearly all of it, arises through what we call sampling variation. That is, if you have a bunch of different samples and you construct some statistic from each of them, then the distribution of that statistic across samples is a measure of the uncertainty in your estimates. And this, this works really well. There's a lot of statistical procedures, which we're not going to use in this course, but which many of you have already seen, which are very powerful and can make use of this. The problem is it's way less general than Bayesian inference. Uh, so let me give you a case. Uh, it works great in what Fisher used it for, which is agricultural field trials, where you can run a bunch of them and you get sampling variation among them, right, for like the productivity of wheat under different fertilizers. Uh, but there are lots of things in physics where the sampling variation idea doesn't make any sense at all. Let me give you my favorite case. Uh, this is Saturn, as Galileo saw it. Some of you know the story of Galileo used some primitive telescopes. He was the first person to gaze upon Saturn or at least sketch it in a notebook. Uh, and, the, and the sketches in his notebook look vaguely like this. I got this by taking a modern picture of Saturn and blurring it. But uh, this is what his notebook sketches look like. And so are there rings? No, it's like a Mickey Mouse, like a celestial Mickey Mouse or something. It's, it's, you can't quite see what's going on. If you want to, what's called de-goss, uh, de-blur this image, um, what do you do? So the, question, the statistical question is, what's the true image? There's uncertainty about what the true image is. But that uncertainty is not comprehensible as sampling variation. There's one image. And every time you look at it, it's going to look the same, as long as it's in the same piece of relative positions, right? Uh, so sampling variation does not extend to these sorts of uh, issues. And in general, it often doesn't. Um, so I have this, this joke in the notes about, uh, about the diversification of songbirds in the Andes. Well, it happened once. Uh, what's this, what's, we're going to rerun history and get a new sample? What does that mean? Now we're going to talk about time travel, and pretty soon we're going to be watching Doctor Who reruns. And <laughs> we're still not going to be figuring out how to do the statistics of resampling the diversification of songbirds in the Andes. Um, the Bayesian approach to probability uh, progresses just fine in these. There's no obstacle because we can talk about the uncertainty using relative plausibilities, uh, and the logic works fine. Um, that's Again, this isn't to say that frequent statistic doesn't work. It, it's very powerful. It's unreasonably powerful, even in cases where it's logically it doesn't apply, like the diversification of songbirds in the Andes. I think often there's work there that works really well, despite the fact that it isn't coherent to say that we're going to resample songbirds in the Andes. Right? It still can work, uh, which I think is interesting. Uh, and worthy of study. Um, but uh, I thought this is the clearest case I could give you. So one way to think about Bayesian probability is the probability 
the uncertainty when we talk about probabilities in, in a Bayesian framework is always a, a, a product of our incompleteness of information. If we had total information about, about the world, there would be no probabilities because we know what was going to happen. Right? So coins are not inherently uncertain. They're governed by physics, mainly Newtonian mechanics. Uh, it's just that it's a chaotic system. The initial conditions when you flip the coin, you would need incredibly precise measurements of everything about the initial angular velocity to predict which side is going to land. Uh, but there's nothing about the coin which is inherently random. The randomness is in us, in our state of knowledge, that we don't have precise enough measurements to make the prediction. Right? It's not the randomness is a property of us or our machines, our models, and not of the world. Uh, now, at this point, someone brings up quantum mechanics, and, and maybe, but I just want to remind you that the interpretation that interpretation of quantum mechanics has never been settled, and there is not yet a single experimental result which distinguishes between the fundamentally random and fundamentally deterministic interpretations of quantum mechanics. Just keep that in mind. Uh, but if it turns out to be fundamentally random, no one will be happier than me. Right? And I'm an anthropologist, so uh, if things turn out to be fundamentally uninterpretable, my field wins. Right. But, uh, <laughs> I say that for the other anthropologists in the room. If only they will get the joke. The rest will laugh nervously. Like, what? <laughs> but, uh, so uh, the, I will come back to examples of this as we go. You just want to think about the probability as a measure of the model you've made, your golem, to continue with the metaphor for the moment, about what it doesn't know. And if we could measure more and more stuff about the world, we could get down to deterministic models in principle. Um, okay. So uh, that's Bayesian inference. Uh, you're going to be learning that uh, in an embodied way as you, as you develop your model fits. Um, the main tool we're going to be working towards is multi-level models. Uh, these are models with multiple levels of uncertainty in them. Uh, there are lots of different ways to describe these models, and when we get to this part of the course, I will go through several of them to help you understand them, because, again, they're all metaphorical. For now, I want you to think about this, uh, as Exhibit says. Uh, uh, we can take a parameter in any model and we can replace it with a model. And so it's like, uh, as I joke in the book, it's turtles all the way down. So what's a parameter? Well, it's like a placeholder for something we don't know. Well, what if we get a model of that thing we don't know? What do we do? We just replace the parameter with that model. And you can, Bayesian inference does this really well because it's very good at propagating uncertainty up uh, the chain of inference. Information moves at the speed of light in all directions in Bayesian models. And uh, uh, sorry, that, that may sound intimidating, uh, <laughs> but it'll just, you'll, your calculations will do it. And uh, so this is the premise of multi-level models, where we have some parameters, and we want to know where they come from. And lots of things can be, lots of useful models can be thought of as multi-level models. Um, the common, for a scientist's perspective, we usually want to know what they're going to do for us. So I give you that list now. Uh, often used, especially in biology social sciences, when you have repeat and imbalanced sampling. So if I sample each of you, what you do during the day a number of times, but I have more data for some of you and others, multi-level models can handle that imbalance. Uh, do the logical estimation of, of what's going on, um, whereas traditional models don't. Um, you can study variation. Sometimes variation in a population is the thing of interest, and uh, lots of classical models have a hard time with that because they don't represent the variation. Um, you can avoid averaging. It's very often that people get multiple samples from, say, a species, uh, like body weight, and they construct an average, and they plug the average into a regression. What that, that's naughty. Uh, now you can learn the right thing that way, but it's naughty. Uh, a statistical term, uh, because it throws away uncertainty, right? There's uncertainty in the average body weight of an adult female macaque. Uh, so uh, with, with multi-level models, you don't have to do the averaging. You can put them all in there, and then the higher level model uses the inferred average with all of its uncertainty. Uh, and this is only, all this does is make your statistics honest, and it makes them more conservative. Um, and it's not hard to do. We'll do it in the last week of the course. Um, Phylogenetic models, factor analysis, path analysis, network models, spatial models, all can be thought of as examples of this sort of approach, or you're stacking together other simpler models. Um, and I think for a lot of students, in my experience, once you kind of get this basic trope of mixing together, uh, uh, like a rector sets, different pieces of models, uh, there's this, this change in your psychology about it. You become good engineers about these things. Um, uh, so I, hope, I want to work towards that. Okay, last um, sort of frontier, as I call it. Model comparison, uh, I, I hope to convince you that most of the time, not always, but most of the time, simple falsification approaches aren't very productive in science. We need meaningful non-null models, and we want to contrast them with one another. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we need some mechanism to deal, uh, to do the contest. Uh, and this is going to take, this is going to be all of chapter six, and it's going to take all that week. Um, and uh, this gets us towards what are called information criteria, which are kind of the rage in biology right now, I think. 
uh, English you see in a lot of journals, and, and uh, editors are like, okay, you've got information criteria, you don't need p-values, uh, kind of thing. But I want to tell you what they actually are, and they're just little models too. They're models of uh, prediction, of forecasting, and as because they're models, they depend upon assumptions, and they're not perfect. They don't do the impossible. They don't tell you the truth. <laughs> right? That's that's how it goes. Uh, but I want you to walk out of here with a real clear understanding of what they're for. They're for solving a problem called overfitting. That is, um, models get really excited by samples, by the data you feed them. And they think the whole world is like that because that's all they've ever seen. Uh, so you've got to uh, deal with this somehow. And there are different ways to do it. And I'm going to teach you um, uh, one, the information criteria, the goal of information criteria is to measure the overfitting risk. That is how excitable a model is, uh, how much it's going to overgeneralize from a sample. Uh, you can also use um, conservative priors, what's called regularization um, in non-Bayesian statistics to do this as well. I'm going to teach you both. And they both work well together, which is why I want to teach you. You should use them both. Uh, one measures the overfitting, the other reduces it. So that's why you want them both. Overfitting is bad because it leads to bad predictions. Um, so these lead to criteria like uh, AIC, the aka ek information criterion, DIC, the deviance information criterion, and WAIC, the Watanabe Akaike information criterion, or actually Watanabe, who's still alive, uh, calls it the widely applicable information criterion. And it's the new hotness that I'm going to be teaching you uh, it. Uh, it's, it's the uh, most recent robust Bayesian form of AIC, is what it is. And um, I'll show you how to compute it. Um, and I always say, yeah, probability and in information theory is inherently Bayesian, so these things all fit together. Information criteria. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you're also going to learn a lot of R, even though this is not a class in R. Uh, you're going to be doing simple scripting in R, and you will be hotshots in R by the end. Some of you already are, I know, and you will be resources. Yes, you will. You, I look at you stare at you meaningfully. <laughs> uh, resources to your colleagues. Um, and R is a giant calculator that can compute anything that's computable. Uh, and you can usually interact with it that way. But I want to teach you a little bit of discipline scripting uh, through your homeworks, where you write your solutions in a strict form and you keep them. And this will be good for you later, years from now, when you really need the information from this course. When you're doing your dissertation analysis. You can come back to those scripts and they'll all be there with your comments and it'll make some sense. And also, there's a certain ethical obligation in science to be able to share our results in a way that are replicable with our colleagues. So when you publish an analysis and you don't have a script that you can email someone so they can replicate your work, that's unethical. It really is. And I know lots of lots of journals and fields don't enforce that, but I think we have to say that that's ethical. And I will say that I have not always done that. I'm a bad person. <laughs> but I want you guys to be better than me. Right? Don't imitate me. I'm a pirate. Right? <laughs> uh, be better. But no, I mean, now I try to do this. Uh, and so I want uh, the nice thing about these inconvenient, uh, at first, um, text-based uh, command line stats processing things is that they force you to write it out in a script so that the replication gets taken care of as you're doing the analysis. Whereas if you're using SPSS, God forbid, uh, and you're clicking around in menus, right, uh, there's no trail of breadcrumbs there. You don't even remember next week what you did. Uh, and then the next version won't even have that command. And uh, that way lies madness. So uh, this is something that becomes a professional skill. It helps you collaborate. It accelerates discovery because other people can pick up where you left off. Uh, and it's quite common. And, and the reason R is such a big deal in the statistics community is partly because of that. It becomes a common coding tool to share results and algorithms. Um, so that it's, it's part of, of doing team science. OK. I've got a little bit of time, right? We end at 3. Is that right? Yeah. OK. Let's, let's start into chapter 2, uh, where we uh, build up Bayesian inference from humble origins. Uh, that'll be the goal. Um, so let me start with another historical metaphor, because uh, that's how I am. Um, Christopher Colombo uh, was a bastard, right? Uh, is he Italian? <laughs> and I look at I look at my Italian reader, but sorry, um, but uh, sorry, Paul. <laughs> you know, exactly. He sailed for Spain, so Italy's off the hook. But he's a right bastard because he gets to the Americas and he starts genocide, right? Horrible, horrible history. But he's credited with the discovery of the world. And I'm going to leave that aside for the moment and instead focus on his navigation choices. So I'll leave the fact that he was, a, he, was a, he was a bastard behind for a second and that we have a holiday about him for some reason. Uh, <laughs> so what's interesting is this is the globe that uh, Colombo used, or Columbus uh, used, uh, to plan his journey. And it was wrong. Now, this is a very small world. He got this from a uh, German geographer, uh, Beheim, uh, who actually made this into a globe. If you Google this, you can find the Wikipedia page, and they have photographs of the original globe. It's in a German museum still. Um, 
this is Asia. This is Japan right here. Um, uh, I don't know what some of this is. Uh, this is Africa and there's Spain. And he plotted his journey to get over here, which is where he was going because there was spice there. Right, is the idea. Uh, turns out, however, that the world was a lot bigger than he thought it was. Um, and there was a lot more ocean there. And he was lucky there was another continent in the way, otherwise he would have <laughs> died of thirst and starvation. Never made it to Asia because the Pacific Ocean is big. Has anybody sailed across it? Uh, it's a pretty big ocean. It's like half the planet. And so he was kind of lucky in the sense, but he had this uh, uh, view of the world, which I call the small world, uh, uh, which he used to plot his journey. And, and, and this, is his, this was his model. Now, of course, back then we didn't have satellites, so this is what he had to use. And the reality was that if you superimpose the, the modern presence, it's something like this. It's actually hard to do because you've got to like, stretch the globe to make space and such, but vaguely like that. And so he ended up making uh, landfall uh, in B Bermuda, we think. Right? I don't know if people have ever figured out exactly where he made landfall. Um, the world was a lot bigger than he was. So I want to use this historical story of a, of a colossal mistake of measurement, uh, which is sad in, in historical light because um, the uh, Egyptians around the time of Ptolemy had made a, a much better estimate of the size of the Earth and knew that the Earth was bigger than that. But then the Europeans forgot all about that work that happened in Egypt way back when. Sort of, sort of sad, right? But... Um, uh, this contrast between the small world and the large world, which is part of the standard vernacular of Bayesian inference, thanks to Leonard Savage in this book that he published in 1954 on Bayesian rationality. Uh, the small world is where probability lives. It's our representation of what we're trying to learn about. And it depends upon assumptions, just like uh, Columbo's little globe. Uh, it's a small world view uh, of what it was. And you have to use small world representations, make models, to make predictions. You have to use them. There's just no other option. Uh, uh, learning about the world. Um, but uh, what we really want to learn about is the large world, and we only learn about through iteration of comparing predictions made with small world devices to measurements made in the large world. And the mismatch between them is an iterative way to make our models better and, and improve science. Uh, so we've always got this, this problem where we're going to spend a lot of time in the small world in this course. Uh, and it's enough to just understand what the models mean in and of themselves. And then we've got this uh, secondary issue of checking the inferences of the models against what we think is going on in the real world. So we're going to alternate between these small and large world contrasts. And I emphasize this. It seems like a silly thing. You're nodding like, well, yeah, of course. Why are you bringing this up? Everybody knows this. But very often people will say, well, look, the confidence interval in my model is really narrow. So, you know, the parameter value must be in that range. But that's conditional on the model being true, right? It's a small world inference. Everything your model says is only true in the tiny logical world, the false world of the logic. Uh, you still have to test it against reality. It doesn't matter how certain your model is, it could still destroy Prague. Right? And so we're going to come back to this. And I'm very sympathetic to the idea that it's easy to forget that because the small world is so seductive and relaxing. It's also perfect and everything works. Right? At least sometimes when your software works. Uh, and the large world is hard. And it may be that in our lifetimes we never quite get uh, to the destination we want. Uh, but we're going to keep coming back to this. And there, the good news is we do make a lot of progress. Um, so... Uh, Got about 15 minutes. I think I can get through the Garden of 14 data. Um, now we're going to build up Bayesian inference, and I'm going to do it in a narrative fashion. Uh, probability theory is just counting. That's really all it is. It is not glamorous. Uh, it's just convenient method of counting an infinite number of possible things. Right? Because otherwise it would be hard to count. Uh, so let me build that up uh, in a simple toy example that will be nothing like your later, da later data analysis problems. So then I think you'll see the logic of what Bayesian inference is. And I, I want to do it this way, just to show you that this is an extremely powerful uh, approach. It's perfectly logical. It is the optimal way to construct inference in the small world context. There's no other mechanism of updating information that could beat it. Nevertheless, uh, it's not glamorous because it's a garbage in, garbage out logical process. It always depends upon assumptions. The things we're going to count in probability theory are events nominated by models. Right? So they depend upon our assumptions. Uh, so there's no way out of that loop except to check against the large world. That's why the precision in the small world doesn't matter. But we want to do as good a job in the small world as possible, so we're going to try and learn Bayesian inference as best we can from this. So I'm going to use as a launching point this uh, short story uh, from, from, uh, from Borges. A number of people know this story. Garden of Forking Pass. No, you should read it. Google it. Read it tonight. It'll, you'll thank me, hopefully. And if you don't, you're a bad person. If you don't like it, you're a bad person. Great story. <laughs> um, you don't have to read in Spanish, by the way. <laughs> there are lots of great English translations. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to use the story in particular, but uh, uh, the, 
the way the the way the narrative and the story unfolds is that it's a it's a story it's a short story about a book that has a bunch of different alternative plots that are like a choose your own adventure thing that branch out through time. It's a great short story. You should read it. Uh, it's also about it's about spies and stuff, which always makes it sexy, right? So. Uh, Bayesian inference is like this in the sense that what we do in Bayesian inference is we imagine all the possible things that could happen. Then we look at what did happen, and we eliminate all the past that are inconsistent with what actually happened. But it is just that. I'll say it again. It's a process of nominating according to our assumptions. We nominate all the things that could happen, all the possible plots, all the possible data sets that could arise according to our assumptions. Then we look at what did happen, and we see which of the past are consistent with what did happen. Typically, there's more than one. Uh, and then that's all there is. Uh, and then we look at the, we do that for each of the possible conjectures, the models uh, that are meant to explain the events in the world. And we ask which has more possible paths that remain that are consistent with what we've observed. Uh, and those counts of possible paths, we're going to walk through this in the next few slides, so bear with me. Those counts of possible paths are become probabilities once they're standardized. Uh, that's all they are. We don't actually want to count stuff because there would be billions of paths that you see the combinatorics and these things explode. So we standardize probability so that everything sums to one. <laughs> and then it's easy to do math with it. And that's really all it is. It's completely unglamorous and it's awesome at the same time. It really is. So um, let's think about this in a, uh, so I said, a simple toy example. This won't resemble the data analysis, substantive data analysis problems you're going to do later in the course. But it's, again, I think you'll see the symmetry. So let's imagine uh, I've got a shopping bag. And it's got four marbles in it. Forget the backstory. There is none. There's probability of zero. <laughs> right. uh, later on, there'll be real data. And so here's the mystery bag. It's got four marbles. Marbles come in two colors, blue and white. Why? Because it's a story. It's a probability of zero. Right. And uh, so what you do know, though, is that there are five possible contents of the bag because there are only four marbles and there are only two colors of marble. Uh, they could all four be white. Uh, one of them could be blue. Two of them could be blue. Three could be blue. Or they could all be blue. Agreed? Those are all the possible events. We'd like to know, uh, after observing three draws with replacement from the bag, so I have one of you reach into the bag, pull out a marble, look at it, someone writes it down, then you put it back, we shake the bag, you pull out another one, you do that three times. Say we observe blue, white, blue, uh, what are the relative plausibilities of these different possibilities? How can we estimate the contents of the bag? And this is a representation of Bayesian inference, uh, how probability theory works in these things. Um, it's also consistent with other non-Bayesian ways as well, but we won't worry about that as we go. Um, okay, so and uh, what I say, one way to think about this is we plant the garden of forking data, uh, figure out all the things that could happen. So let's take a single conjecture of the contents of the bag, one blue marble and three white marbles, and let's consider only the first draw from the bag first and what could have happened. Well, there are four paths in the garden of data. Either we get one blue, uh, there's one way to get a blue, and there are three ways to get a white, right? Because there are three white marbles. And they look the same to us from the way we write down the data, but they're actually different marbles. Agreed? Um, then on the second draw, each of those paths has four paths because the draws are independent. That's an assumption. Maybe they're not. Maybe there's marble magic going on and they stick together. <laughs> but it's an assumption. Uh, so each so we could draw, there's one path that gives us one blue marble the first time, then there's one way to get a blue marble the second time, and three ways to get a white marble. Um, if you get it, there's three ways to get a white marble the first time, and then for each of those, there's one way to get a blue and three ways to get a white. So now we've got uh, four times four is 16 paths, 16 possible data sets. Some of them look the same to us, right? And this will be important in a second. Um, and then you can see here's the combinatorics and why we don't like to count things, right? So uh, for the third data point, now there are going to be uh, four times four times four is 64 uh, paths. And again, it's the same idea. This is the garden of forking data, all the possible data sets you can get in three draws, uh, all the number of ways. Now, let's take the actual observations and eliminate paths. So conditional on the bag containing one blue marble and three white marbles, and we observe blue, white, blue, how many ways is there to get that under this assumption? And we just eliminate stuff, and you can see. Well, the first thing that has to happen is we get the blue on the first one. So all these are eliminated. Then there are three ways to get a white marble on the second go. So three ways stay alive. And for each of those, only one way stays alive. So there are three paths that are consistent with the data. With me so far? This will look more useful as soon as we look at the other contents, the other possible contents of the bag. Then we can do comparisons. Yeah? So let's do that. Um, 
we're going to do we're going to contrast these different ways. So possible contents we've only done the second uh, possible contents so far. There are three ways to produce the observed data. Um, for the other ways, first thing I want to assert to you, and I don't think I need to draw the trees, is that the first and last are impossible because we've observed at least one blue and one white. So there are going to be zeros in there, and there are no paths for those that are consistent. Those are impossible. Make sense? Sometimes you're lucky, and that's true. There are some theories which are completely incompatible with your data. Yeah. And uh, uh, the others, it's harder. Usually, and when we do science, there are a bunch of conjectures that consist of your data, but to different extents because different numbers of ways are consistent with the observations. So I'm just showing you again our previous garden, but I know I've made it a wedge in the upper left. This is the thing I showed you before. Um, then let's consider the, the second one. Uh, suppose the contents of the bag were two blue and two white. Um, now, two paths survive on the first draw because the first draw was a blue marble. Then, two paths each. Uh, can give you a white marble, and then two paths each for those give you a blue marble. There are eight ways uh, to observe those data, right? So it's more plausible than the first, actually. Now, it's not a slam dunk, uh, eight ways versus three ways. I wouldn't bet my house, and I bet your house, uh, but not mine. Um, uh, we don't have a lot of evidence. Uh, uh, the final way, three blue marbles versus one white, there are, uh, I won't go through the exercise because I think you get it, uh, there are nine ways that are consistent with the data, which is slightly more, not a big difference. These are going, these are plausibilities. Uh, they will be in a second when we standardize them. They are the relative numbers of ways um, that each of these uh, hypotheses, if you will, each of these conjectures about what's in the bag could produce the observed data. And this is all Bayesian inferences really does, but it's going to be, it's going to be abbreviated into a mathematical formalism, which saves you all the effort of doing all this counting. It's actually way easier than this. But the, the risk there is that it becomes superstitious sometimes, right? It's like, it seems magical and and, and magically rational, and it's producing all these optimal inferences in the small world, and it does do all that stuff. But you have to remember that it has this unglamorous beginning of make some assumptions, count up all the ways that you could observe, make, uh, observe what actually did happen, conditional on your assumptions, compare the different conjectures, and that's all it is. It's amazing that it's so useful, given that it's so asininely dumb like this, right? Uh, but this is an amazing form of inference that has, uh, uh, I don't have to convince people taking this course, that Bayesian inference does a lot of powerful things. But that power depends upon the assumptions being useful. Not that they're true, but that they're useful in particular contexts. Um, so let me do some summary. Uh, one of the things that comes from this is, as long as the events are independent, you can multiply uh, to get the total number of ways, right? Because it's just multiplication. It's just a shortcut for addition, right? Repeated addition. And that's all it does here. Uh, so we've got zero way for that to happen. Um, zero way for this to happen, and then three, eight, and nine. Uh, so these are more plausible than that one by some relative amount. And you're like, well, it's not a big difference, and you're right. Uh, but that's one of the nice things about Bayesian inference is that an estimate and its plausibility, the strength of evidence, are the same thing. It's all in the relative values of these numbers, and that's typically what we do is we standardize them. Before we do that, I've only got a few minutes here. Um, uh, you can update as new data arrives. You don't have to repeat the whole calculation. Uh, this is called Bayesian updating, and you'll get you'll get a more formal introduction to this when you come back on Thursday, and we'll do it the kind of textbook way again. So again, we're just in the narrative form right now. Um, same conjectures. Uh, say we take one more draw from the bag, we get another blue marble. We know the ways to observe one blue marble. All these conjectures: zero, one, two, three, and four. Right? I don't have to draw gardens <laughs> for that. Uh, we've got our previous counts of numbers of ways. Uh, to get the new counts, we just multiply the two together, uh, and now we start to get some divergence. Right? Uh, uh, among them. And every additional data point changes those relative counts uh, in the same predictable way. It's called Bayesian updating. Um, and it's an optimal way of learning in the small world. In, in the large world, there is no optimal way of learning. So I'll, I'll try to unpack that later on in the course, but I think that's often true. Uh, uh, one way we think about this is, is the use of prior information. Sometimes we receive different kinds of data, and we've already got a previous analysis, which has given us relative plausibilities of the different conjectures. Um, and we'd like to update those. Uh, Bayesian inference is really good at this. It's one of its major selling points. Um, there are things that are not good about selling it, like it's computationally difficult. But uh, the, the ability to mix and match different kinds of information and to use prior knowledge about a system in our statistical analysis is a huge advantage, I think. So imagine in this case, for example, uh, we've done the previous analysis, and then somebody tells us, but, you know, at the factory, the blue marbles are rare, so in the production process, we make sure that every bag contains at least one. Uh, this is, changes the relative ways to get different bags now. Uh, and so these are ways. Uh, so 
we as long as we as long as these numbers are correct relative values, relative numbers of ways for these conjectures to arrive for sampling for drawing things out, we can use it as prior information uh, and update um, them with our data analysis. So in this case, uh, it doesn't matter which is logically prior or, or after. These are the ways we had before. Multiply those by the factory counts. And again, now you get this switch where this one seems more plausible because those kinds of bags were produced by the factory more often sort of thing. Now this is all uh, absent some real scientific context, so it might not seem uh, completely relevant to you, uh, but that's by design so that you get the basic logic of it. And once it's, once it's in the middle of a scientific context, you have to worry about measurement error and all that other fun stuff, which is essential. Uh, but the purely logical exposition here is just meant to be clear. Does this make sense? A little bit? Okay. Last thing, and I'll let you guys go, and we'll pick up here on this slide when you come back on Thursday. Um, punchline for now is that the un unglamorous basis of all applied probability, not just, not just basic, but all applied probability, is you imagine a small world system where you can count events, and there are different possible processes that could be producing these events. So if you want to make continuous plausibility inferences about which of these processes is consistent with the data, all we can do if you want to be logically consistent uh, with the assumptions, there's one way to do it, and that is just to count up all the ways you can see the data according to each process and compare those relative weights. And that's all there is. And probability theory is just standardizing these counts so that across different systems, the, the relative counts always sum to one. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, here, I'm just going to say we're going to relabel each of these conjectures with some number, which is the proportion of blue marbles in the back. This will later become a parameter. You'll be excited by that. Uh, ways to produce data. If we sum up this column and divide each value in it by its sum, we get plausibilities, which are, in fact, probabilities. Probabilities are any non-negative real number where the set of them sums to one. Uh, and then all the actions of probability apply. And that's all probability theory is. Uh, some of you already knew that. Uh, um, uh, but this is the superstition freeway. All right, um, I've held you guys over 30 seconds. I apologize. Uh, come back on Thursday, and we will cruise into some computation.